Hi, I'm John Prenner. Welcome to another edition of the Retina Today Video Journal Club. We're pleased to have one of the rising stars in our field today, Dr. Darren Goldman from the Retina Group of Florida. And Darren's going to be talking to us today about a recent paper that he has completed with some authors uh, from Boston about expanded indications of pneumatic retinopexy, the impact of those economically, and uh, give us some highlights about what we should be thinking about going forward. So Darren, thanks for joining us today. No problem. Thank you for having me. Can you talk to us a little bit about kind of the background, what prompted you to take a look at this data series? Absolutely. Well, you know, I got, when I was doing my residency and I didn't really see too many pneumatic retinopexies and then in fellowship they were much more popular and so that got me thinking well why do some people do them why do some people not and when I looked into it it seemed like really the preferences and trends of pneumatic retinopexy were highly varied uh, dependent on regions preferences and a lot of different things and so that that got me thinking and looking at uh, the patient population we had it was really a good opportunity to study pneumatic retinopexy in, in high numbers. And so that was really behind the idea to do it in the first place. And then I've always been kind of interested in uh, efficiency and cost effectiveness, and that sort of just tied into this project and gave it just a little extra bump. So definitely there are, you know, we all think we're right with whatever we do all the time. And so there are regional trends. So when you were in California, you saw lots of surgical uh, yeah, interventions absolutely. to fix retinal detachments. Exactly. And in Boston, uh, you saw many more uh, you know, less invasive procedures with pneumatic retinopexies. Correct. I would say on the West Coast, I saw almost no pneumatic retinopexies, mostly buckles and vitrectomies. On, in the Northeast, at least, it was more variety with a, with a preference more in favor of pneumatic retinopexy than other areas. So which kind of patients, you know, you're talking about expanded indications. So we talk to us a little bit about, you know, what the standard patient who right. would get a pneumatic Absolutely. retinopexy is, and then who are the patients who are being treated. Uh, we can talk about success rates later, but who would you treat in Boston with these? expanded indications? Well, so first of what we did was we looked at all of the patients we did and we kind of divided it into two groups. The first group was what we called traditional and so that's more or less what you're asking about. So that those are patients that had a single break or multiple breaks within one clock hour that was isolated within the superior two-thirds of the retina. And most people would say that's a reasonable candidate and most people would say in a phacic patient even better. And so we sort of, that's what we kind of considered our traditional group, although we included pseudofix as well. Um, and then in our non-traditional group, it was kind of everything else. And so uh, this included things like vitreous hemorrhage, a bridging vessel, if you had more than one break separated by more than one clock hour, if you had visible traction on a retinal break, uh, and if you had an, an inferior retinal break, extensive lattice degeneration, those were sort of the main ones we looked at. And so uh, we, we looked at them all together and looked at certain things of them all together, and then we analyzed differences. So what did you find first in the cohort who had the traditional uh, uh, indications? Right. So we looked at both anatomical and functional outcomes. The main focus was really the anatomical outcomes. And if you lump everyone together, our overall anatomical success was about 78%. If you split it up as the traditional versus non-traditional, the traditional group, our success rate was 84%, and the non-traditional group, the success rate was in the mid-70s, about 74%. Um, and one interesting thing we did in our analysis was we looked at factors that were most predictive of failure within the non-traditional group, mm -hmm. and we found that those three factors were an inferior retinal break, visible traction on a retinal break, and the pre-existence of significant PVR. And so what we did as part of our analysis was we eliminated those three factors and reanalyzed the data just to get a sense of what that would show. And with that analysis, the difference was much closer. So in the non-traditional group, our anatomical success was 80%. But it is worth pointing out, either way we analyze it, this, there was no statistical difference between the two groups, uh, which is important, although there was a trend towards the traditional group having a better outcome. Got it. So what happens when, you, you know, when I talk to my patients about how we're going to intervene, I think, you know, in general, I think if you have a pneumatic retinopexy and it works, that's the best outcome. Right. Uh, I think that's the best visual outcome, and, and it's almost like it didn't happen. Um, but there's impact to that because I think the failure rate is higher in the pneumatic retinopexy group compared to if I did a scleral buckle. Mm -hmm. a, you know, a good pneumatic is a great buckle. Right. Um, it's not a huge difference. It's maybe 10%. But I guess what happens to the 10% of people who fail? So in the pneumatic retinopexy group, if you failed, 
what happens when you're subsequently repaired because I think that is you know sort of really the, the issue if it doesn't right. work are you any worse off than if you went to the OR in the beginning that's another key area where I had a question coming into the study and in some ways the study wasn't really designed to look at that um, but there are some things that you, you could could look at for instance uh, why why did the, the ones fail that did fail the majority of the pneumatics that failed failed from persistent traction on a brake or a new brake and it was very much the minority that failed from either new or progressive proliferative vitreoretinopathy which was somewhat of a surprise to me I at least ha had had some people tell me that PVR was the main reason for failure and uh, so the key here really is if somebody is failing to identify that and, and intervene in a timely fashion. And so when you're counseling your patients about the different ways of repairing retinal detachment, if you're going down the road of a pneumatic retinopexy, clearly uh, you need to inform them of the higher likelihood of requiring a secondary intervention, be it uh, laser, cryo-retinopexy, or even a surgical intervention. So what kind of follow-up, what's your typical follow-up? You do the pneumatic retinopexy on day one. Right. How often are you seeing? It sounds like you want to be seeing those patients fairly frequently. Absolutely. So you do want to see them more frequently than a uh, traditional post-operative patient that had surgery. But uh, once you get a good handle on, on how these patients do, if they're doing well, you don't necessarily need to follow them ap as closely if they're reliable patients. But our typical follow-up regimen would be day one, if they're doing perfectly and there's no fluid, the retina is flat, good gas bubble, we'd see them in a week. But if there's anything that's not perfect, and this is common, whether it be a small amount of residual fluid or something else just isn't right, we would follow them at a closer interval, be it every two days, every three days, something like that, until we have a better handle on which way they're going. And talk to us a little bit about the economic impact. You know, we're all faced now with right. Uh, lots of data mining that's going to happen to our procedures and our costs. How does the pneumatic retinopexy fare in terms of cost savings? I would imagine it would be substantial right. and maybe overall cost for how you're managing those patients because if they fail, they oftentimes will go to, you know, potentially a more complicated procedure. Yeah, that's a, a key question and a, a key thing I was interested in before doing this project. And so you have to back up a step and, and, and ask, well, how many what is the distribution of pneumatic retinopexies uh, throughout the country right now? And in the U.S., at least, that's about 15% of non-complex retinal detachments are managed that way. And looking at our uh, patients, we actually were managing about 30% of patients, a little more than that, with pneumatic retinopexies. And so uh, by uh, one thing we did was we eliminated those three things that were most predictive of failure that I mentioned already and came up with this optimized figure. We thought about 30% was an optimized rate of uh, optimized outcome and cost savings and looking at the actual numbers uh, a pneumatic retinopexy costs about two thousand dollars inclusive of potential uh, reoperations if there are failures whereas a buckle or vitrectomy costs about four thousand dollars so it's about a twofold difference and if you're looking at uh, numbers right now uh, with the distribution of 15 percent of pneumatics the overall cost in the US is about 220 million dollars for RD repairs if you were to bump up that number from 15 to 20 percent, uh, you could save $7 million. And if you were to bump it up all the way to 30 percent, you could save uh, upwards of uh, $30 million. And that's probably an underestimate for, for reasons we probably don't have time to go into. Well, it's a very compelling argument. I think it's a really interesting data set. Uh, we appreciate your time and a uh, great paper. We look forward to seeing all the great work you're going to be doing going forward, and hopefully we'll have you back on uh, in subsequent years. Yeah, it was a pleasure. Thank you Thanks, for having Aaron. me.